we will definitely be sending humans to Mars. It's just a matter of time. The plans are already in the works. Perhaps 20 years from now, in 2033 or 2035, an international crew of astronauts will embark on an epic 45 million mile journey to the Red Planet. This is a picture of the Earth taken from the surface of Mars. Traveling this vast distance will require the astronauts to be in transit through deep space for at least six months. Should anything go wrong, there will be no quick way home, as orbital mechanics dictates that the round-trip journey could take as long as three years. The astronauts will face many challenges, both physical and psychological. It is an extremely dangerous endeavor. Some consider the journey to be so hazardous that they talk about it in terms of a one-way trip, a kind of suicide mission. The hazards include the psychological stress of living for up to three years with the everyday reality that nothing but the wall of the spacecraft separates you from certain death. Plus, the harsh radiation environment of deep space will only exacerbate the heavy physical toll caused by prolonged weightlessness. Numerous long-duration space flights to the International Space Station and its predecessors, the Russian Mir and Salute space stations, have revealed a long list of health problems resulting from prolonged weightlessness. These include loss of bone density, muscle atrophy, a compromised vestibular system, impaired eyesight, impaired mental ability, fatigue caused by loss of sleep, and a diminished immune system. However, there is an equally long list of health problems facing the astronauts when they return home and try to readjust to gravity here on Earth. Although not widely reported in the media, Astronauts and cosmonauts returning after a long-duration spaceflight lasting six months or more are so weak that they are unable to support their own body weight. And they invariably have to be carried from their spacecraft. Plus, the vast majority of astronauts returning from a long-duration spaceflight suffer from dangerously low blood pressure, this is a condition called orthostatic hypotension. It is caused in part by dehydration. But also it is symptomatic of cardiovascular deconditioning. Their weakened heart struggles to pump blood to the brain. This causes the astronauts to feel faint. They may possibly black out. There's presently no known cure for this problem. Astronauts returning from a long-duration space flight also report problems with balance and hand-eye coordination. They fail hand-eye coordination tests that they previously aced before they went into space. The bone loss that I mentioned previously this may not be reversible, despite the fact the astronauts exercise for up to two hours per day whilst they're in orbit. Astronauts returning from a long-duration space mission enter a, a rehabilitation program, the purpose of which is to help them rebuild their muscle strength. This program can last up to a year, during which time the astronauts report feeling extremely vulnerable to bone fractures 
in particular. According to the testimony of astronauts who have first-hand experience with long-duration spaceflight, it takes one to three days to recover for every day that they have been weightless in space. Now, imagine what it would be like for our intrepid crew of astronauts at the end of a six or eight month journey to Mars. As they maneuver their spacecraft for a landing, they could be subject to a, up to as much as six Gs of deceleration, at which point they will succumb to the cumulative effects of six or eight months of weightlessness at the time that they need to be at their very best, they will feel at their worst. Weak, dizzy, and nauseous. They possibly may even black out or even die from hypostatic intolerance. Landing the spacecraft remotely, sparing the astronauts the need to actually control the spacecraft during the descent and landing phases, overlooks the real problem. Should the astronauts actually survive the landing, they will likely be incapacitated by the surface gravity on Mars, which is considerable. It's about 40% of what we experience here on Earth. They will be so weakened by six or eight months of weightlessness that it will be a struggle for them to lift themselves out of their seats, let alone don their spacesuits and climb down the ladder to the Martian surface. At the time that the astronauts actually land on Mars, they would have already completed a long-duration spaceflight but there will be no recovery team to help them, no rehabilitation program to help them grow accustomed to the surface gravity on Mars. In short, the challenge for the astronauts traveling to Mars is that their main mission begins when most other long-duration space flights end. Now, there is a very straightforward solution to all of these health problems that I've described to you that have been caused by prolonged weightlessness. And it is called artificial gravity. Artificial gravity is an example of a centripetal force. And the centripetal force is required for circular motion. There are many examples in nature. Here, I illustrate a stone tied to a piece of string. The centripetal force is provided by the tension in the string which continuously pulls the stone into a circular path. Now, instead of a stone, imagine that we have an astronaut, indicated here by the stick figure, standing on the inside wall of a circular and rotating space station. Now it is the wall of the spacecraft that provides the centripetal force that continuously pushes the astronaut into a circular path. This is what we call artificial gravity. Now, there have been many depictions of artificial gravity in many science fiction movies including film director Stanley Kubrick's remarkable 2001 The Space Odyssey. And here you see a large circular rotating space station in orbit above the Earth. It provides artificial gravity for all on board. The structure does not have to be as majestic as the one depicted in the 2001 movie for example, two expandable habitats, one at each end of a long truss, would suffice and be far more economical than a complete ring. 
Even better would be four expandable habitats that would provide more living space for the astronauts and a higher safety margin should any one of the habitats be compromised for any reason. In order to re reproduce artificial gravity equivalent to that on the surface of Mars would require a structure that is 2,400 feet in diameter and making one revolution per minute as illustrated in this diagram. One could make the structure smaller and maintain the same level of artificial gravity by spinning the structure faster, but there is a trade-off. Spinning the structure too fast could induce motion sickness and a whole set of other problems for the astronauts. The idea of rotating space stations is deeply ingrained in popular culture as a result of movies like 2001, Interstellar, and The Martian. And yet, the reality is that no rotating space stations have ever been constructed or operated. Indeed, very little research has been done to explore the enormous potential of artificial gravity. Consequently, all of the benefits of artificial gravity remain to be discovered. The International Space Station, illustrated here, is not a rotating space station because it was designed to provide a weightless environment that is difficult to reproduce here on Earth. And it is studies that have been performed on the International Space Station that have confirmed the long list of health problems caused by prolonged weightlessness. And it is those same studies that have revealed the equally long list of health problems facing the astronauts when they return home and try to readjust to gravity here on Earth and would presumably also face should they land on Mars. Given all that we now know, I am doubtful that any regimen of diet, exercise, and pharmaceuticals is going to cure these health problems caused by prolonged weightlessness. I'm also not convinced that the cost of artificial gravity is prohibitively expensive. On the contrary, the design that I show here would be a small fraction of the overall cost of a manned mission to Mars and may make the, over, the, the, the overall difference between success and failure. So, I issue a call here and now to all spacefaring nations and all space agencies, be they commercial or otherwise, to develop an artificial gravity research program in anticipation of future manned missions to Mars and beyond. Thank you.